good afternoon. And uh, Ron, I must say thanks to you again for bringing us together and focusing the mind. It is so important for that to happen, to develop pathway and action points that we can all be guided by. We have been publishing Carib News for 32 years now, and the mission has simply been to not just communicate, but to empower our people, and our people in the broader sense. And so um, the newspaper does that, and of course the conference builds the economic peace, and the peace in terms of how do we work together? How do we come together to benefit our own, uh, from our heritage and history to, to benefit our own communities? And so um, there's a strong desire and effort for not only the economic development of the Caribbean and Africa, but also the political one. And Having done the Caribbean for 17 years, we had a delegation from Africa, South Africa in particular, who said this should be happening on Africa's soil. We are thought leaders, business persons, uh, coming together, elected officials to really work through the issues. And we felt, we took the challenge and felt it was one next step in the Pan-African effort that Ron has been pushing me towards. And it was exciting, but we soon learn how business happens in different ways, and so we are not discouraged. We have learned, Sometimes you win some and you learn some. So we learn from this experience not to give up on the strength that comes from coming together within the larger diaspora. With respect to the Caribbean and the question of the future of democracy and development, there's a tremendous amount of goodwill in, in this room, in this country, and around the world for the Caribbean. But both democracy and development in the Caribbean at this time is really threatened, and threatened by internal and external forces. The Caribbean, and as uh, Herbert point out, we have variety in the Caribbean, but we're gonna use the Caribbean in general. And this is true for just about uh, most of the Caribbean countries. They are burdened by heavy debt. For most Caribbean countries, the service in those debt between, exists between 70 to 75% of revenue. That means you have 25% to do your governing, your, kept, your recurring expenses. So you are, you are literally frozen in a situation that doesn't give you much maneuvering room. So the governments of the Caribbean are not in a position to even come up with credible or practical development plans. And this situation is brought upon the Caribbean over a long period where you have fed these loans to a large extent to engage American companies, American projects, that you are now faced with paying back those debts. And these debts are so frozen that the IMF looks to, the IMF that the, the Caribbean would go to for funding, looks to those debts as first to be serviced and then prohibit the countries from acquiring any more debt. And so there's very little room for maneuvering when it comes to a development plan coming out of the Caribbean. 
the net result of that is that whatever development that is going to happen, whatever movement in the form of job creation, in the form of uh, investment, is undertaken by foreign investors. And so the foreign investors, who of course will pick and choose those plans that benefits them, of course repatriate the profit and is not committed to the long-term development of these countries. Because uh, a number of these countries do come up with development plans, but there's no way to implement it, and the foreign investors will pay lip service to it, but it doesn't happen. And you find this is happening throughout the Caribbean. So you look around the Caribbean and you find that there are very active Chinese investors investing in the projects that they have a particular interest in or in many instances benefit their plans, their development plans. You look around, there are Japanese. The coffee industry in Jamaica, which was a pride of Jamaica, is taken over strictly by Japanese. They control it. The Taiwanese are in a number of the country, smaller countries and they're doing their thing in terms of trying to influence those countries to support their plans. And so you find that any national development plans with lack of resources, foreign investors picking and choosing, everything is happening in a haphazard and unfocused manner. This is witnessed clearly by CARICOM, and I gather the Prime Minister talked about CSME, the Single Market and Economy. It does not exist, people, because there's nothing to be managing. CARICOM is a shell. CARICOM, which is the, the, the regional trade organization, is a shell because the development plan that should be happening and coordinating and integrating does not, in fact, exist. And if you take a, 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 a brief walk through the traditional development sectors, tourism, remains the main driver of our Caribbean countries. But the vast majority of the tourism properties are owned by foreign investors. And there's very little upward development that can be realized if your main source of development is tourism, especially tourism as it exists because you're training people in the leisure industry and it is to be serving. But it remains their largest sector. Agriculture, who, which at one time provided the bread basket of the region, is now down to 6% of the production um, output. We have a gap in imported agricultural product that is widening. That means we are losing the battle even in agriculture. We cannot feed ourselves effectively. Manufacturing is local and largely non-existent. The creative industry where we thought we had some leverage in terms of music and fashion and film is not organized around any program that can be expanded. And so you look at energy, we have the same issue. The financial services where uh, Barbados, Bahamas, Cayman Islands, certain small countries were able to carve out some kind of um, niche that has been shut down by the OCD. And even little Antigua, which is, game, which is internet gaming, the United States of America shut that down. 
And so as you look at fishing, maritime industries, technology, what have you, we are suffering from a gap. And it's a gap that is real and one that has to be, attention has to be paid. And so uh, we see this situation complicated to some degree by the situation that the Caribbean government finds themselves in, combined with what we see as the insatiable appetite and demand of drugs from the US. And so this illegal drug drugs trade becomes a perfect situation for the Caribbean to become a key transshipment point for illegal drugs. And so it is a newly form of revenue in the gray market. This situation has led to organized gang, uncontrolled drugs, guns, crime that is no, crime is now the most serious problem in the region. Every issue of care abuse that we have, crime is the issue. And so combined with the, the frozen ability of the governments to, to invest and to now face with this drug-driven crime situation, that investors now are looking at the Caribbean in a negative manner because they do not want to be invested in a crime-ridden region. And so, folks, the vicious cycle continues. Additionally, now the local communities are feeling the adverse effect of the illegal trade. People are gone down, kidnapping is now common, and even beheading has started in Trinidad and Tobago. As you go through the paper, you have murder rate going up in Trinidad, murder rate going up in St. Lucia, murder rate in Bahamas, and in Barbados. This is what you see throughout the region. So in a way, it is not a pretty picture. And it's not a pretty picture because it is, it has such a tremendous impact. And so um, the looking at democracy then, and since we were asked to look at that too, the same forces that impact the, the development aspect impact the democratic uh, process. Although the Caribbean region has a fairly strong uh, democratic process in terms of elections, fairness, strong opposition, access to media, but those forces that are controlling the economy are now looking to control the democracy, and so that is threatened also. And I've been signaled that I need to wrap up. And what I'd like to, to, to end with, though, is that their great mind, tremendous goodwill in many institutions who are looking at these problems. And the, the, the solutions will come from those institutions, and it will come from us within the diaspora. And this is why the conference that we organize is so important. And several people in this room has been to the conference where we bring thought leaders, business persons, politicians to understand what is happening and to determine solutions, both macro and micro solutions. And so we need to continue. We need to not to be discouraged. I want to paint a realistic picture, but not a discouraging one, because we know we have a fairly high literacy rate in the Caribbean. We know we have a, there are signs of uh, 
uh, increased, uh, reduced level of poverty. There, there are some excellent indication, indicators. Plus, we know the Caribbean people are resilient and determined and are talented. So um, it's not a basket case, but it's a case that one needs to be realistic around and try to bring the forces that can help to change the situation. Thank you.